Welcome listeners, you are currently listening to The Mentionables Podcast. On today's episode, we have a treat for you. This is the very first meeting, well okay, technically the second meeting, between Mentionables Tyler Vela and Nick Peters, long before the Mentionables were actually a thing. This is an interview Nick Peters did with Tyler on his podcast, Deeper Waters. Now, the relationship between Tyler and Nick is legendarily adversarial, or at least competitive. Unfortunately, what you see here is the two of them getting along. There's no competition or disparagement or insult whatsoever. But it's still a decent episode, and you'll enjoy the interview. So now let's listen to Nick Peters and Tyler Vela on Deeper Waters. Tyler Vela studied philosophy at California State University, Sonoma, but completed his degree in Biblical Studies at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Tyler is currently working on his MA in Biblical Studies at Reformed Theological Seminary. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Now, how did you get to be doing what it is that you're doing today? I mean, how did you become a Christian? What's your introduction to apologetics? Things like that. Uh, By the grace of God go I. Uh, I was raised in a um, non-Christian home, uh, just kind of a secular, um, relig- it wasn't really like atheistic or anti-theistic, it just, the religion just wasn't the topic, it just didn't, it didn't come up, I wasn't raised religious, didn't have any religious friends growing up, I, I, uh, I, I'm actually surprised, that I, I'm looking back, I remember uh, just a while ago thinking, what, what did I think about Christmas carols, like did I even know what we were singing? I, I didn't. I don't even think I could have told you what uh, the Christian story was uh, for most of my for most of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, was in college actually when I first started studying uh, anything even having to do with religion, uh, and it was largely because of my philosophy classes where uh, I took my metaphysics class at Sonoma State, and it had um, a section on it about uh, God. It's a metaphysics class, so we went through arguments for God and, and all of that. Uh, and it was uh, the the argument from morality that actually started kind of pulling me out of my my naturalism, um, pulling me into kind of a broad philosophical theism, um, and that's that's uh, I was about, almost about 20 years old when that happened, uh, and then uh, came to know the Lord through uh, the ministry of um, uh, Dan Kimball when he was at uh, Santa Cruz Bible during their college ministry. Uh, and then uh, have been serving in the church ever since, a couple different churches. Um, moved out to Chicago to go to Moody to finish my degree uh, and, and have been uh, doing apologetics and, and ministry and youth ministry and uh, ever since then. Um, and about, probably about six or seven years ago is when I, I was on Facebook and I got into a group and was in discussion. Uh, with some internet atheists, and that kind of sparked my interest in having a podcast and a blog and a Facebook group, and that's where uh, the Free Thinker podcast started. Originally, it was Logical Theism, mm-hmm. um, but now it's uh, the Free Thinker. Now, one of these internet atheists you very interacted with, and I didn't even know he existed until a few months ago, is a guy named David McAfee. Who yes. is this guy? <clears throat> David McAfee is... I, I've been talking with him for... Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got to be almost six years now. I put out the first edition of the book review back in 2010 uh, when he had his first edition of his book. And I've been talking to him for a while before that. So it's, it's got to be all closing, closing on six years now. Uh, David is, he was an undergraduate from UC Santa Barbara in their religion. I think he was a religion and an English double major. So he got two degrees. Um, and during his undergrad, um, well, this is what a lot of people don't understand, is the, the book Disproving Christianity, which was his, his freshman book, was actually written and published before he graduated, uh, from, from what I remember. Uh, and I, I know it was definitely written before. I can't remember. If, I think it was published right around the time of his graduation. It's self-published. Um, and and it was, it, it's, it's pretty abysmally bad. <laughs> Which I'm, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean it's 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 pretty rough. Uh, it's now in its second edition. Um, the second edition, he didn't really update anything in in the main portion of the book. There was there were some minor tweaks here and there, but not really anything. The second edition basically just added on a couple of chapters, a couple of little appendices at the end. 
about other little topics, a couple more, you know, two or three page little rants uh, mm-hmm. um, about different topics. It wasn't really updated, and that was picked up by Dangerous Books. Mm-hmm. And he has, uh, so he started kind of in that self publishing empire type of type of thing. He has a Facebook group that's now, uh, I think he celebrated. He was at 50,000 likes uh, a few months ago. I think he's somewhere around 70 or so now. Um, so it's growing. He's getting at, he's speaking at conferences, skeptic conferences, uh, and, and kind of making the, the speaking route. So he's, he's raising in popularity, which for people like you and me who are, who are used to engaging in, in, in these discussions is, um, well, well, I, I always like to say it's discouraging at one point because you want to look at it and say, how are these people who are, who are, so ignorant, and I should say David's a really nice guy. I've met him for dinner. He's a really nice guy. He's, it's not like he's, you know, he's a jerk or anything like that. He's really nice. I, I you know, I, 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 I take him out for beers or something. He's really nice. But what he says is so wrong and, and so uneducated, and so it's, it's surprising that he gets so popular. But at the same time, it's really encouraging because I'm like, if this is the type of atheism that's growing, right? We're not seeing people like mm-hmm. Ram Oppie having huge followings. Right, I I would be worried if there was fifty to seventy thousand likes uh, for atheists that are that are as robust as Graham Oppie, <laughs> right? That would be that would be hard. Uh, but the fact that we're seeing this type of internet infidel kind of atheism growing is is somewhat encouraging because it's it, it just reminds me if if they had better arguments, they would be using them. Uh, but for many, this is their best. Yes, my first encounter with uh, seeing in the Christian Project line someone talking about the book and I had enough money to get the Kindle edition so I thought mm, I'll use my Amazon points here a gift card <laughs> go get that see what it's yeah. like took me probably about a day to read it started one day finished the next and if I had covered all the numerous mistakes that I highlighted in there my response would probably been as long as his book was yeah. Because it, it was just four of mistakes. And I want to point out, there is no bibliography. Oh, yeah. So there's, no, there's no research. I mean, you're, you're right. So I, I, um, I took the time to before, write a... Before you yeah. go on, we should say, this, the book is called, by the way, Disproving Christianity. We have not said that. Yeah. And the second, edition, the second edition is called Disproving Christianity and Other Secular Writings. Right. Um, yeah, so for my book review, I decided to do uh, a line-by-line critique. I was going to do kind of uh, an overview critique of major problems. But I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get this opportunity that often to address so many misunderstandings in one spot. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to plow through and do it. And yeah, the book review ended up being, uh, it's about 79 pages, single space of a Word document. It's much, much longer than the book itself mm-hmm. um, because normally uh, adding clarity and nuance and critique and putting in research and quoting scholars, it takes up more space than one or two sentences of just sh- sheer assumption mm-hmm. uh, based on no research whatsoever. Yeah. And really the thing about 70,000 likes just so stuns me when I see it because just this week, Deeper Waters got 700 likes yeah. to go reached on Facebook. I'm not talking about 700 new likes. I'm talking about 700 all together. Yeah. And I remember talking with someone saying, who was in the Philippines and saying, hey, can you send me your review of McAfee's book because he's coming here and he's speaking. And I'm saying, good grief, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah, he's becoming an international speaker. Yeah, and it, it it makes no sense <clears throat> to me whatsoever. And I think, yeah, it, it seems like the atheist community wants to push their agenda a whole lot more than the Christian community does. Yeah, yeah, and we should say, you know, some of those likes are going to be Christians like us, yeah, <laughs> uh, who follow it. So it's not all. Um, but the the group itself, and I'm sure we'll get into it. The group itself has become pretty, uh, pretty hostile, and and it's a, and it's a weird dynamic because. Uh, David is, I mean, for 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 all the problems, he's he's great at marketing. Uh, he's great at he's great at getting a following. That that's that's obvious to see. Um, and when you look at his page, a lot of times, what he's quoting is himself. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a screenshot of a conversation he's having with someone, or it's a, it's a it's a graphic meme of one of his quotes from his book that either he's produced or someone else has produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he's he's really he's really self promoting himself uh, quite a bit, and I don't say that in a bad way. I mean, <clears throat> if this was going to be you know. Uh, I, I do the Free Figure podcast because I because I enjoy it and I and I'm in the ministry for God. But if I you know if I was out there to make that my career and and to do that, uh, I mean there's nothing wrong with promoting promoting your work. Mm-hmm. Um, but but he really is he really is talented at that. Um, but there's a weird dynamic that that's kind of grown. David, as he's gotten more popular, um, his 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 own tone has become much more moderated. Um, his content still remains just as bad. I mean, his assertions are just as bad. Mm. Uh, his actual arguments are just as bad. But his tone has become much more soft, much more moderated. He 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 says now that he's not out to destroy religion, which is questionable. Um, but at the same time, his group has become much, much more hostile, much more vitriolic. It, mm. If you're a Christian, you go in there and you say something, it's just... There, there are a couple people who will engage in dialogue, which is really the only reason I'm still there. There's, there's so many. It's just you just get accosted by insults uh, and mockery, and, and mm. it, it really is like being being thrown to the piranhas at that point. Um, it's, it's, it's abysmally bad. Um, and then when you respond with with asking questions just about their views, they they can't critically engage with their own with their own viewpoints. It's just. Well, well, you're a Christian, so you have to prove God before I even talk to you, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is uh, bizarre. Yeah, when you were talking about the thing was just taking a screenshot and such. I mean, one case I'm remembering particularly is how he made a claim once about the uh, myth about thirty thousand denominations and yeah. such, and I responded, and I left a pretty long response, and he pretty much put up what. I said, then what he said, left out everything that I said in response. And when it was where it was tired, like, here's another major victory, here's another apologist slain and things. Yep. yep. No, no dude. You don't even have a clue what you're talking about. You haven't done the basic research behind the question. And of course every single one of his fanboys and girls very me were laughing it's like, Oh jeez, isn't that ridiculous and such and it, it it's it's really sad to think this is what we're up against. Yeah, it's 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 getting pretty it's getting pretty sad. Um there's there's been a, a lot of groups. It's not just David's group. This is this just seems to be the track of um kind of the the internet infidel um movement that's that's uh kind of spawned from new atheism. Mm. Uh people like uh myself and others have have been pretty comfortable now uh calling this uh, atheistic fundamentalism. Uh, yeah. It has all the marks of all the marks of fundamentalism. Mm. Um there's there there's actually an article by an atheist uh on on atheistic fundamentalism of the new atheism uh that that I posted to David's page which was which was fun to see the response to that from the group. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely interesting, and it, it I I wish I, I kind of wish that um, in the Christian community there were some sociologists who would who would do some good sociological work on this movement and mm. and see um, kind of some of the trends and the movements and the and the the really what seems like group thing happening uh, kind of organically in these movements. I think that'd be an interesting interesting project for someone to do. If we've got any Christian sociologists listening. There's your challenge. That's something <laughs> I would like to see. Okay, I'm on it. As well. And speaking of challenges, in fact, I know I've made the challenge, and I'm pretty sure you have made the challenge as well. Where I wrote a blog post once about an open challenge to David McAfee to face me in debate on Christianity sometime. And I posted on his page, and it wasn't even acknowledged at all by him whatsoever have you issued a similar challenge yourself oh yeah Uh, well uh, so this is this this goes way back so uh, a lot of people don't realize this it's funny a lot of his followers say you know I'm I'm a troll and I'm just there trolling his page and all that kind of stuff and I want to you know it's like well I don't think you realize that that David and I actually had had a book project together Uh, so originally um, my my review. The reason why I agreed to update the review for the second edition was 
because he was going to post or he was going to, to approach Dangerous Little Books, which put out the second edition, to bundle uh, his book and my review together as one book and put it out. So it would be like a point counterpoint type of thing. Um, once he saw the review, um, that crumbled. Now, he said it was the publisher wanted him to focus on pushing his book uh, rather than doing another project to sell more books, which seems bizarre. Um, but but he, he backed out of that one. So then we were in talks, and we were going to do a point-counterpoint. We were going to take about 25 questions and say, how would a Christian answer it and how would an atheist answer it, and then give a brief response to each other. So kind of like one of those point-counterpoint books. Uh, that completely fell through again. Once, once I, I, I sent him over and I said, you know, this is, um, this is how, like a list of questions that I was thinking about. What would you think? Here's some responses. Uh, he said, we, he basically backed out and said, no, I, w- I would like to focus on my own book whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm just not sure he's up for the challenge of debate. I, I posted my book review on his page. It's been po- it's been published on my blog. It's been published. It's on Scribd. You can get it on Scribd for free. Um, so it's it's you can get it. It's been in my Facebook groups. You know since since I since I put it out in 2013, the new edition. Um, you can get it there. So he knows about the review. He's never once engaged with it. Never once. No, not, mm-hmm. not one time has he ever uh, has he ever corrected anything from it. Uh, it took me actually taking a picture of a of a flat out false thing that he said in his book for him to to even post that he'd been corrected. But even when he said he corrected it, uh, it was about saying that Lot was uh, showed to be righteous throughout the entire Old Testament. And I said, well, Lot's never mentioned again throughout the Old Testament as being as being righteous. You're thinking of Peter. And he said, well, I should have said that in Peter. Therefore, the Bible, you know condones what Lot did and all that kind of stuff. Just terrible argumentation. <clears throat> He's never engaged. I've challenged him to public debates. Uh, I've, I've asked him to be on the radio show. Um, my friend Nicholas Bruzzese, who's uh, one of the co-hosts with me on Fight Club, uh, we were going to get him. Uh, Nicholas uh, had another show called Skeptic's Testament where Nicholas was going to moderate a discussion between us <clears throat> as being like a third party so it could be recorded. He denied that. I, I've said we could do a Google Hangouts recording. He's denied that. I mean, so he just he refuses to engage um, with anyone who's who's critical of his views in any type of substantive ways. He has no problem doing screenshots of these really shallow, really terrible. Like if I look at him, I'm like, even I think that Christian's being stupid. He has no problem <clears throat> putting those up on his Facebook page. But anyone who has a substance of challenge, he he'll, he'll never he won't he won't engage. He won't respond. And his followers will will basically say, well, he doesn't want to, you know, why would why would he engage with you? Why you know, would you engage with someone who defends a flat Earth? Like, would you take your time out of your day for that? You know, yada yada yada. Um, and so it's just it's just he's so insulated from any type of robust criticism uh, that that it's that it's hard to imagine how he thinks himself a critical, uh, you know, quote unquote free thinking skeptic. Well, we should mention something here because there's another misconception since you mentioned your review is that. You were charging five dollars for your review, yep. and he was giving out his book for free, yep. which I thought was very interesting since I bought it on Amazon. So. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the funny thing is, so <clears throat> this is yeah, it, it was a funny incident. Uh, look, definitely looking back on it, so he's always charged for his book, <clears throat> always charged for the the paperback and the Kindle. It's just if you if you if you messaged him, if you send him an email, he'd give you a free PDF copy. Right. Mm-hmm. So a while ago, I had some people who wanted to donate to the podcast, uh, and and I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't have, you know, I, I don't have PayPal. I don't have anything set up to to support the podcast. I I still don't. Um, and so they're like, well, well, instead of giving us a free copy of the book review because it's you know eighty pages long, uh, you know, why don't why don't you why don't we pay for that? And I was like, no, no I'll just give it to you. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And they're like, no, 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 we really want to pay for it. So rather than setting up PayPal and going through putting the link on my website and stuff, I was like, well, I'll just add the charge on Scribd. I didn't think anyone ever got the review from Scribd. I thought they all got it from my my blog or from Facebook or from just talking talking to me. You know, I only have 500 followers. It's not like I have 70,000 followers. Um, so I put the charge on Scribd just for those like one or two people who had who had approached me and said they wanted to buy it. Well, apparently David or, or someone uh, of his followers thought. And they're like this, you know, this apologist is charging for his 
charging for his book review, uh, and that's how that whole thing came up. And I had to show him. You know, we took screenshots of of the upload in the Facebook group and say, no, it's been a free PDF. You can see it's been uploaded since 2013. Like, you, it, it's been free this entire time. Um, and and he actually posted that twice. He tried to make it a big deal uh, two times, which is which is which is always uh, interesting when he does something like that. So, yeah, it was it was a it was a funny little incident. Yeah, we've talked about the term of atheist fundamentalism here. Another one that I like to use is atheistic presuppositionalism. Yeah, where it, it comes out of the start with well, atheism is true. If you're rational, you're going to be an atheist. If you follow evidence, you're going to be an atheist. Therefore, if you believe in anything religious whatsoever, you're being irrational because atheism is true. And so we don't really need to look at any counter evidence because, hey, all rational people know atheism is true. Right, right. It's just I, – I prefer fundamentalism just because there – I don't. I don't know if enough of these people are even reflective on their own views uh, to to really even realize that that's what. It's just like brute. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it's almost like this uneducated brute reaction um, that they that they have. Um, it's and it's 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 bizarre. There's there's a really strong for for people who say they love argument and evidence and reason. There's a really strong anti-intellectual. Uh, trend within the group mm -hmm. um, there there's it, it's funny because I'll constantly have to point out to them what what an internal critique is for example so if they want to say you know and I think you talked about this on your show before if they want to say you know well well uh, God is immoral in the Bible because he commands genocide right for example mm -hmm. that's an internal critique right so within christianity that's saying let's let's assume let's assume the bible if that's true then god's commanded this horrible thing and look god would be immoral right mm -hmm. and so when when you start arguing with them and you say well no because you know god is loving because there's this thing as sin this human responsibility you start going through why on if they actually are on christianity that's not true they're going to say well god doesn't exist anyways mm -hmm. okay well that's not a, you know then you're leaving the internal critique behind your inter your internal critique is invalid then, mm -hmm. so they don't you know you have to you have to work through this kind of thing and when you're going through it and you say well you know have you read any scholars that agree with you have you read you know what academics are you read they they'll they'll flat out say well I don't I don't need to read any of that because the Bible is stupid mm -hmm. right well yeah. how do you know how, where where do you come to the the opinion that the Bible is stupid if you don't know the first thing about the Bible mm -hmm. right. It, it, it's this it's this catch twenty two of ignorance where they they the more they're ignorant about it the more they think it's stupid but the more they think that's stupid the more they'll remain in their ignorance. I've come kind of come up with this theory that the it's a proportional theory that the ignorance of an internet atheist is directly comparable to their arrogance. It's 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 probably pretty close. Which is that's a really good point actually because. One of my main interests is the type of rhetoric that's used mm -hmm. <clears throat> and and how the the more I talk to, to atheists, and I, we might be able to bring up some of these, the more I talk to these Internet atheists, the more I find out that these little cliches, these little soundbite memes that they kind of parrot oh, yeah. over and over again, you can't – a lot of times they're in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, it's, it's an interesting th th thing to see how how – in conflict, those those types of things really are. I just did a I just did a show recently um, where we were talked about. Well, if 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 you did, you know take their view where atheism is a lack of belief, uh, and belief is basically synonymous with faith, which is what they think is belief without evidence. Mm -hmm. Then, if Christ were to come back today, no one would have belief because we would all have knowledge, so we'd all lack belief. So we would all be atheists because we know that Christ is real. Mm -hmm. Right, you you have this you, you you just have all these like problems if you try to hold all their all their all their rhetoric in place. And one of them is the strange thing. I'm really glad you said it. Is they will often mock Christians. Right, we're we're so arrogant because we're we're so certain that God exists and we're so certain that you know Jesus rose from the dead, which which is already a caricature anyways. 
But when you talk to so many of these internet atheists, they're so certain they're 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 so certain that we're stupid or deluded or or you know just following a you know quote unquote bronze age myth or anything, and and they just they they're unwilling to even question anything that they that they've said because they're just absolutely certain that it's that it's fact mm-hmm. without any question. Yeah, one example of this that I think we could definitely use. And this is when that McCaffrey even says in his book, it's just coming out, there's not even any real evidence that Jesus even <coughs> existed. And yet, yeah. I mean, most every New Testament scholar on the planet at that point, atheist, agnostic, Christian, Jew, whatever, is going, seriously? You seriously want to say that? Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty bad. It, it's it's a it's a search for anything. Uh, it, it's it's anything is reasonable and rational evidence uh, that shows that Christianity or the, or the Bible or some type of religion is false. And uh, when when you brought up memes, I mean, that is an excellent point. I love to use memes, but I use them as illustrations of arguments already established or to make a sarcastic point that I'm already arguing for anyway. Yeah. Most atheists I see put up memes as if they're arguments in themselves. And real arguments don't exist in just sound bites. You really have to engage the material. And memes, to me, like, when people do that kind of thing, it just shows a lack of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't even think they, they put them up as... as, as I think they're putting them up because they think they're a statement of fact. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's not even... I mean, it's not even a developed argument most of the time. It's mm-hmm. just... Here, here is this statement uh, from a comedian or something, and, yep. and it, it, it isn't it obviously true? Isn't that that's just fact? That's just a conclusion, yeah. right? Yeah, <clears throat> which and, is which is strange. And there's so much going on behind the claim, so much back information that's misunderstood that you have to go and start there. But usually, internet atheists start the idea the caricature that we put up is the real view that Christians have. Yeah. One big one that you talked a little bit about is the notion of faith. And when this comes up, I have a quote on my computer. Because I've got a little apologetics database where I have quotes and such from scholarly sources. So I can pull them up at any time. And I have a quote from Pilch and Molina's Handbook of Biblical Social Values where they talk about faith and point out it's not blind belief. It's trust in that which has shown to be reliable. And I'll put that up and of course it gets dis acknowledged immediately because well, you know, this is what faith really is and Yeah. And think look, I'm here, I'm arguing, I'm giving you reasons why I believe that should tell you I'm not believing something without evidence, but it's a whole lot easier to just deal with a straw man. Yeah, and that and that's you know, like I said, I'm really interested in how their rhetoric kind of kind of interacts with each other. This is another one. So, <clears throat> how often? I mean, I know you debate with atheists online. Mm-hmm. How often, when we talk about atheism, right? The definition of atheism, because if you, if you actually look at the definition of atheism, it, it like the third definition down is a lack of belief, right? It, it's almost always the doctrine that there's no such thing as God. Yeah. You point this out, and they say, well. That's just your concept of atheism. <clears throat> You're not listening to what atheists actually say they mean by it. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, how many times have you heard that? Oh, yes. But at the same time, so I always tell atheists, fine, let's say that there is a concept of faith that is belief without evidence. That's fine. I can, I can take that as a, con- a possible meaning of the term faith. Mm-hmm. I'll, gra- I'll grant you that out the gate. But that's not the Christian. That's not the biblical concept of faith. That's not the concept of faith that I'm talking about. I'm talking about this concept of faith where faith is an act of, it's not an act of the intellect. It's not an, act, it's not an epistemological ca- uh, category. Sorry, Dr. Bogosian. It's an act of the will. It's an act of volition. It's, it's saying I'm placing my trust. My, mm-hmm. my, my belief that the plane will carry me to, to the East Coast, that's my belief. My faith is the act of me getting on the plane, yeah. right? That that's that's my faith. That's my act of trust. If anyone that's wants the to category hear, I'm talking about. Yeah, if so. anyone wants to hear a little bit about that, just listen to the episode of Unbelievable, where Tim McGrew had a so-called debate with Bogosian. If you want to have oh, a debate, <laughs> that was sad. That was a massacre. Even one skeptic tweeted on 
Twitter afterwards and said McGrew massacred Bogosian's chickens and Peter Bogosian grew exceptionally quiet after that debate. Yeah. Well, the funny uh, so <clears throat> kind of a kind of a sidebar. Well, let me just fi- just finishing the thought. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll look at the atheist and say so so I'm supposed to take your concept of atheism and work with that that that's 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 the meaning of the word. But are you going to do the same courtesy to me and say, well, so that's the concept? They're going to say no, faith qua faith. Mm-hmm. All faith, just what faith is, is belief out. There can't be any other concept. There can't be any other notion. Every mm-hmm. time someone uses the word faith, they mean belief without evidence. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, it, it's just, it's just, it's just bad. But going back to the Bogosian thing, I mean, um, anyone who listens to the podcast, he is actually the one that came up with the challenge of doing the survey uh, of people afterwards and saying, well, what do you mean by faith? And it was funny because it was Tim McGrew, the Christian, right? This, this might have been embarrassing, who had to actually make it more scientific. Yeah. He had to say, well, no, let's, let's separate the believers and the unbelievers. Let's find out what believers mean, and let's find out what unbelievers think believers mean, uh, and see what the two sample sets are, because otherwise you're going to get blending categories. And so you had the Christian saying, well, let's make this a little bit more scientific, shall we? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the results came out, and it was completely opposite of what Bogosian said. And so I put up a post saying, okay, now, is Bogosian going to follow the evidence, or is he going to go by quote-unquote faith? Yeah. It's just, it, 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 and, and he still has. He hasn't changed his view. You know, we're still faith is still an epistemology. It still should be in the DSM, right? It's all this kind of stuff. Well, I've written my own view of Bogosian's book, and in fact, I'm an even more people who's banned from his Facebook page. So that's a lot of fun. To talk about, <laughs> and I, I, I'm still look forward to the day when sometime I'll get to encounter a street epistemologist in person. When I when I heard that he was planning on a television show with coming to area churches called The Faith Whisperer and talking with Christians trying to get them out of, faith, out of their faith. It, it might have been The Faith Whisperer. It might have been The God Whisperer. I don't remember the name exactly now, but it was a TV show. It had Whisperer in it. And I, when I heard I think a lot of people were saying, oh, you must be really upset about this. Are you kidding? I would love for him to come yeah. to my church. Please come to my church. Keep those cameras on. This is going to be an interesting discussion. Come here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. C- please come on by. I, I don't yeah. mind. I, you know, if, if Bogosian's listening, I go to Church in the Canyon in Calabasas. Like, come, come by. <laughs> we'll have a conversation because yeah, um, it's, if it's just bad. Yeah, if he's listening, I attend the Point Knox in Westtown, Knoxville. Here, he's free to come. Come ask for me. We'll we'll have a good discussion. I have no problem talking on a show like that. Yeah, yeah, and and it's funny because so, I'm kind of going back to the the internet infidel atheist fundamentalist. Uh, you know, movement. Uh, when you're talking about faith, well, the, the, then they'll then they'll resort back to, well, it's got to be faith because you have no evidence, you know, for what what you believe. Uh, which which again is just it's just a strange argument because because I, I want to say, well, well, no, you just think it's bad evidence. Right. right? That doesn't mean there's no evidence. You you just don't find it compelling evidence. Right. Right. But by that same rationale, you know, uh, someone who you know a young Earth creationist, for example, can say, well evolutionists go on blind faith. They go based on no evidence. And if the evolutionists want to say, well, no, I have X, Y, and Z evidence, the, the young earth creationists can just say, no, that's bad evidence. I don't mm-hmm. find that compelling. So you're going on no evidence. Yeah. Right? It's, it's just terrible, terrible rhetoric. It, it, I mean, it, it makes no sense. Yeah, and this is one thing I always find with internet atheists. They love to talk so much about topics they haven't really studied. I mean, you yeah. brought up evolution, for instance. I'm not touching that one with a 10-foot pole because yeah. I'm not studied in the sciences. I like yeah. the philosophy of science, like the history of science, but I don't know science as science. So I'm not going to go out there and give an argument for the Big Bang Theory or for or against evolution or even for or against a younger or for an older from a scientific perspective because that's not my area. Yep. But for an internet atheist, it looks like if you're an atheist, you're an authority on whatever you talk about simply because you're an atheist. Yeah, which 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 is funny because mm-hmm. uh, at, at that same time, mm-hmm. I, I look at these people and I and I and I, I just wonder how many of you. So you you say that you should believe on evidence and all this kind of stuff. You shouldn't believe based on authority. How many of these people have have read anything outside of their their high school textbooks on evolution? Mm-hmm. How many and how many of them are just going on? Well, that that's just what us good skeptics and evolutionists believe. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm not saying it's true or false. I get, I'm with yeah. you. I, I just I haven't studied it. I lean towards that that that's probably true. Uh, I, I have no idea. I just haven't studied it. 
uh, and enough to even even pretend to, to be able to make a, a, a good argument either way. So I, I just I wonder, you know, how many of these people have have studied mm. any of this that they're talking about before they before they pontificate on it? And they look to people like David. And I get these conversations, and because David in his book he calls himself a scholar twice. Right. Right. He he calls himself a religious scholar because. He studied it in an undergrad, which is laughable, right? Anyone who's right. done any any graduate, postgraduate work knows that an undergraduate degree is 30,000 miles wide and one inch deep, right? You do not become an expert in undergrad. Uh, yeah. You don't become a scholar. Even if you became an expert, which you don't, you're still not a scholar. You're not publishing a peer reviews. You're not, you know, employed by uh, an institution of higher education. You're not, you, you don't have any, you're, you're, not a, you're not a scholar. You're not an academic. Yeah, I mean, so you, you and I are both this. you and I are both working on master's degrees at the moment, yeah. and even if we had master's degrees, we probably still wouldn't even call ourselves no. scholars no. yet. I'm, I'm going to wait until I get a doctorate. No. I'm going to wait till I get a doctorate, and I'm employed by some type of higher institution, and I'm and I'm publishing in peer-reviewed uh, academic journals. I, I'm not I'm not a scholar, even if I'm highly educated. I mean, I I I have a huge library. I, I've read I've read more on these topics than than uh, you know probably some people who do have masters and, and PhDs just because it's my sheer interest. But I'm not a scholar. My yeah. my thought and my work has not been vetted by people who are experts in the field. Yeah. Now on, on my end with that, I mean, I've had uh, people come to me and try to call me a scholar, and I've corrected them. Now some yeah. of them like will say, well. I think you're going to be a great future scholar. Okay, if they want to say that, that's fine. If they want to say, your work seems very scholarly, okay, right. that's also fine if you want to think that. But to say, I have a title right here, no. And unfortunately, too often, when atheists get put in the limelight, they're immediately seen <coughs> as scholars. I mean, I'm thinking, when Joseph Atwell came out with Caesar's Messiah, yeah. claiming that Rome created the concept of Jesus and he never even existed and Rome put together the New Testament and such. Yeah. And by Rome, I don't mean the Catholic Church. I mean the Roman nation itself. The the, the articles were immediately saying, a biblical scholar, Joseph Atwell, yeah. he's not a scholar. Right. Not even a little bit. No. <laughs> not, even, not even a little bit. And, I mean, but you have this in this movement. I mean, you have... Uh, you have uh, Fitzgerald and David McAfee, and you, ha you have all of these kind of self-publishing, you know, empire type, you know, writers mm -hmm. um, that 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 are getting looked at as the these are their experts, these are their go-to, and we, and you know, and and I'm sure you'd agree with me. We're, we're prefacing. Look, just because someone's uneducated in something doesn't mean they're automatically wrong. Right. Right. I mean, he, their their arguments could be good, but when you when you look at the the type of stuff that they're writing, that's so under research. You you mentioned McAfee's book has no bibliography. It has no citations. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, well, that's not true. I think it has like one or two, but it's like a Wikipedia article and a newspaper article or something like that. There's there's no research done. There's there's no critical mm -hmm. commentaries. There's no scholars. There's no experts. Yeah. There's 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 nothing like that done. There's there's not a lick of research, and when you read it, it shows. It shows really, really bad. In fact, one of the points where he says, uh, you know, New Testament scholars uh, write about this, and he says there's this problem in Galatians. If you read the the what the the problem actually is in Galatians, if you read the 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 expert in Galatians where it's talking about the the law being delivered by a mediator, mm -hmm. it is not the problem that McAfee is trying to say scholars have a problem with. Yeah. <clears throat> and and saying that there's a problem is is a massive overstatement. There's disagreement on all kinds of passages. It doesn't mean there's some major right. you know problem within within scholars. They all basically agree on the same thing. They're just talking about the most minute differences uh, um, among things. So, and, but he, but you know he'll say scholars disagree, but he won't he won't cite any of them. Mm -hmm. Not not one. Yeah. When you're talking about people who are self-published and such, I mean we we have to be clear on this because. You know, I've got self-published books. I'm not going yeah. to probably say because something's self-published, it's wrong. And no, I've got, not at all. I've got a blog. I've got a podcast. Yep. And so people could say, well, geez, Nick, why should we take you seriously? And my answer is that if you don't want to, you don't have to. Check yeah. what I see. Check it out with a scholarly material. See if you think it holds up. Yeah. But please I mean, if you want to present an argument as if you think it's got authority for me, that's fine. But please don't present me as a scholar. 
because right. I'm not one, and I would try and point you to the best scholars when I can. Right. Yeah, and 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 the and you're not saying, look, you should take me as authority because look, I have a book. Yep. Right. I mean, it, it's 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 just completely it's completely different. There's nothing wrong. I mean, I have a blog. Yeah. I have I have you know a podcast. I'm working on on writing a couple self published things or, or or you know minor published things, and and, and it's it's. But I, but I'm not going to look at that and say, look, I I have a book, therefore you know I have an undergrad degree. I'm working on my master's. I have a publisher. I'm a scholar now. <laughs> right. It's just that's just not how it works. That's not how that's how it goes. But he's but he's perpetuated that image, <clears throat> and so when you go into his group. People look to him as an expert, right? They're asking him right. to speak at conferences as an expert, right? The, the, this is this is how they view him. And when you go in and, and you comment and you say, you know, look, he has he has zero understanding of this, they're going to say, oh well, you know, he has a degree. Okay, mm-hmm. so I, I have a, he has a degree in world religions. He says that it's an expert in in Christianity and Mediterranean religions. If you look at UCSB. The number of courses that he would have had on Christianity are so minuscule and they're so broad uh, that it's hard to understand. I have a degree in biblical studies. Am I an expert? No, but I guarantee it's much more directed on that subject than his. And when you read his book and he's dealing with the problem of evil, the problem of suffering, for example, and he doesn't mention the cross... Mm -hmm. There's no possible way that you can say he understands Christianity. He doesn't have to say that it's true, but yeah. if you don't understand at least the most basic positions, right? I mean, this is like my my junior high Sunday school class when I was teaching junior high Sunday school would have known better than this, yeah. right? I mean, it's just if if you don't even know that Christianity the the at least the proposed solution to evil and suffering is the cross of Christ, you don't know the first thing about Christianity, and you're just not paying attention. Yeah, you know when we're talking about this kind of thing, it, it's the mixed blessing of the internet, I think, in many ways. The internet can allow people who wouldn't necessarily always get a voice to get out there, to do their work, to to let people know what they're saying as well. It can be a great thing. On the other hand, the negative side of the internet is it allows people who wouldn't get out there, who wouldn't normally have a voice, to get their work out there yeah. as well. And... <clears throat> Pretty much with atheists on the internet, I noticed that if you just find a link in a search, you can look like you've really done your work, and you haven't. I remember being in one thread with someone, an internet atheist, and by the way, we should explain when we say internet atheist as well, we don't mean every single atheist on the internet. There are some yeah. atheists on the internet, but you can have good dialogues with them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Them. But absolutely. we're talking about a certain mindset here, and this person was trying to tell me that the uh, Council of Nicaea edited the New Testament and was re- behind canonization as well. And they brought right. up a link to Roger Pierce's website, Tertullian.org. I think. Okay, this has to be something wrong here because I know Roger Pierce. He's a good researcher. He's a great researcher. He's a very conservative Christian. He's much better than to make a claim like that. Now, you could say... Well, the link they gave, it was a long, long one, so you'd have to read very closely to find out what he was arguing. No, no, you didn't. Because the very first paragraph said, these are some common beliefs about the Council of Nicaea. These beliefs are in error. (laughs) And I posted that, and I cut and pasted and said, here's what your own source says. Right. And it, it, it was like talking to a brick wall. Yeah. Yeah, the the it it they their the reading comprehension is is pretty low mm-hmm. a lot of times, and there's a lot of times where, I, you know, I, I'm sure you have this experience, and and a lot of your listeners do. You've had these conversations so many times, I could almost predict what they're gonna say. Oh yeah, uh, because I know their sources, right? I know, yeah. you know, I've read EvilBible.com, I read through Infidel, you know, Internet Infidel, right? Uh, you know, Iron Iron Chariots and and Ratio Wiki, right? Which are mm-hmm. just if you, if you see those, you're just like, oh, this person's biased, yeah. right? If, if 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 you see that as a source, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you you know that something's wrong, right? You're getting if you're getting all of your information about the Bible from EvilBible.org, um, not a lot's happening in the gray matter between the ears, basically. So you you see these types of things, and and this is just this is what passes for reason. I remember on the show I was doing. Um, uh, I did about four, a four-part series responding to um, the Thinking Atheist radio show that did a, mm-hmm. that did a series on uh, counter-apologetics, right? So the whole series was supposed to be 
on on doing counter apologetics, right? How to argue against ca- apologetical arguments. And just over and over and over again, the the thing I kept coming back to was this this is what counts as reason for these people. Like this is this is actually what they think reason and, and reasonable, uh, rational dialogue uh, and, and thought is. Right. Yeah. This this is this is the best that they got, um, and it's just tragically bad. Yeah, and when I think you mentioned something about bias, and that gets to something interesting. I see with you know an atheist talking about that if you present an argument from a Christian scholar, that's bias information, and you oh, yeah. can't trust it. If you present an argument from Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, purely objective, and all should listen to it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Yeah. And and if you're if someone's a biblical scholar, they're a theist and they're wrong. Yeah. Right. Right. Completely ignoring that. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, there's great scholars on all sides of the worldview. Yeah. But even if you know, even if you're a Christian scholar, you, you know, you're mm-hmm. you could still be a great scholar. Uh, but but and a lot of it just comes back to they you know they have no arguments. They're they're parroting off these type of of memes that they've heard to say. Mm-hmm. Right. And and it, and if all else fails. Uh, don't you know that us theists always have the burden of proof always uh, every single time? Yeah. Right? No matter what the argument is, they, they, the, I, I got in this kind of long discussion with someone who just kept going round and about, and I just try to be as polite and nice as possible, and I'm, he said Christianity is disproven. And I said, okay, can you defend that claim? He said, no, can you prove me that God exists? Well, I don't need to. You're, you're claiming a positive disproof. If I, if I came out and said evolution's been disproven... Yeah. I would need to support that claim, right? I, I couldn't say, well, I can get away with that claim until you can prove to my satisfaction that evolution is true. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm claiming a positive disproof for something. I have the burden of evidence to, to to prove that disproof. And and there's so many times where this comes up, and they say, well, look, unless you can prove God, I don't need to engage. I don't need to defend any of these thousand claims that I've made, right? Because because you're defending a sky daddy or something like that. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and it's, you know, when yeah. Yeah, you know, and when you make those kinds of questions to them, I mean, if this guy had an interact with you before, for all he knew, you could have been a fellow atheist. You're just saying, "Hey, I'm very interested in this claim. Can you back it?" I mean, when people talk to me about the burden of proof, I always make it very simple. Anyone who makes a claim has a burden. Yep. If you make a claim, if I make a claim, Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. Okay, I got the burden. I have to show that. If you make the claim Christianity is bogus, okay, you have a burden. You have to show it. It could be we both have a burden of proof because we both make claims. Yeah. And if I'm the Christian, I go forward and I argue, and I just present a terrible argument, and I do not present any proof whatsoever for Christianity or for theism or anything like that. Atheism is not proven from that. All right. that's shown is I made terrible arguments. You still have to make the positive case for your own side. Right, and th- and that's a point that that that's always that's always good to bring up. I always bring up the example of sun humans, mm-hmm. <clears throat> right? If if I were to come to you and I would say there there are humans living on the face of the sun right now, I would need to prove that claim before you were to believe it. Mm-hmm. But if you were to say no, you're stupid, you're wrong, you're irrational, that's false, you're deluded, yeah, right? You're not you're you're not lacking a belief. You're not withholding belief until you see evidence. Right. right, you're saying it's false. It's not true. It's it it is inaccurate. You are deluded. Mm-hmm. Right, you're making a positive claim. Now, you might have a much smaller burden of proof, which is fine. Actually, uh, I I did a podcast again on this one and, and had a couple blogs on it. If I was an atheist, I would have no. That's fine. I have burden of proof. It's such a minimal burden of proof. The burden of proof to say that there's no such thing as unicorns is so much smaller than the burden of proof to say that there is unicorns. Mm-hmm. Right? I, right. I actually, I've gotten to a point where I kind of, I, I've gotten to a point where I want to stop arguing against atheists who say that it's a lack of belief because that just makes it so much more trivial uh, and so much easier to argue against. Because uh, all we're discussing is your personal psychology at that yeah, point. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. It's, it's just, it's just a, okay. Then, then you're, then atheism is true. You lack a belief. Great. Yeah. I, I mean, that's it. it. <laughs> I mean, it's like if I came to see you one day and said, well, Nick, how are you doing? Oh, I feel miserable today. No, you don't. You feel great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how are you supposed to argue against that? I mean... Yeah, there's no point. I mean, I could just say, oh, okay, I have God belief. I mean, you're not going to come and yeah. say, no, you don't. I mean, yeah. you can say, 
yeah, your God believes wrong and such, but you can't argue that I have it. Yeah, and if, if atheism is a lack of belief, then by parallel, theism mm -hmm. is just the presence of belief. Mm -hmm. So they're both just trivially true descriptions of what people believe. It, it, just, it just makes it completely pointless yeah, uh, I, to I, even debate at that point. I love the unicorn reference also, because as soon as this comes up, I already know what's going to be coming up is someone's going to say, have you ever heard of Bertrand Russell's teapot? Right. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Hey, here's a blog post I wrote on the teapot, okay? So yeah, I know all about it already. Yeah. And... But the thing is that people are act like Russell's teapot or a unicorn or even the uh, flying spaghetti monster are metaphysically equivalent to God. Yeah. Like you can make any any <coughs> any argument, plug God in instead, and it works the exact same way. It has the exact same impact on reality. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually I'm working on a show. Uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where I came up with the title first. And I was like, oh, I got to make a show that backs this up. Uh, so the the title of the podcast that's gonna be that's gonna be coming out is called Weapons of Mass Disambiguation, uh, because because there's a there's a certain point where where you want to say, look, uh, part of the goal of reasonable thinking is to make distinctions, right? To disambiguate right. concepts that aren't analogous. Mm -hmm. So so if 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 an atheist thinks that God, the tr you know classical theism, the concept of God is analogous to a flying teapot or a flying spaghetti monster or an invisible gardener, mm -hmm. they're, they're just conflating concepts that are completely unrelated. They need to disambiguate. There, there are important distinctions in these, con in these concepts. For example, God, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned presuppositionalism. God can function as a transcendental necessary precondition for the existence of things like logical laws of uh, logical laws and absolutes mm -hmm. right a flying spaghetti monster cannot mm -hmm. right uh, God is not an internally incoherent concept a flying spaghetti monster right just in what flying spaghetti and monster what those what those terms entail are internally contradictory it's not a coherent concept Right, so you have these these issues uh, where where the concepts themselves are just not analogous to each other. But these people haven't done any research. They're they're not trained philosophically. They're not trained, uh, you know, to think reasonably or even scientifically. Although they, you know, they love hashtag science. Uh, they're, they're not trained to think that way. And so when you try to get them to talk and think that way, right, they're, then they're going to come back to you and say things like. Well, if God really was omniscient or omnipotent, you wouldn't need to think these this way. You wouldn't need to look at scholars and experts. Oh gosh! Right? It it mm -hmm. if we wouldn't need to go to experts. It's just it it is that anti-intellectual. It's it's going back to that fundamentalism yeah. where you have the you know the the those fundamentalist young earth. I'm not saying all young earthers are fundamentalists, but there is a young earther fundamentalist who are going to say, well, don't go to university, don't read the experts, don't read the scholars because they'll poison your mind because they're too they're too biased. Mm. Or right. a tour that of same Satan thing. or something like or, that. Yeah, something like that. You're going to have that same type of, it's just going to be the secular side of the coin where they're going to say, well, those, those people are too biased, it's too wrong, it's too false, you, we don't need to read those people, right? You, you know, it, it's the exact same thing, just the secular side of the coin. It, it, it's like what Peter Bogosian says in his book, when he's asked, what would it take to convince me that I'm wrong? He says, I want to borrow an argument from Lawrence Krauss. If I walked outside one night, and all the stars in the sky spelled out, I am Yahweh, believe in me. And everyone in the world saw this, and it was in their own language. That might be suggestive. It could still be a delusion, <coughs> right. but it might be suggestive. And you know, as soon as I see that, I think, okay, what you just told me in that statement is, I could make all the arguments in the world for the existence of God, and they are not going to convince you until you have some magnificent, grand experience that no one in the history of the world has ever had. But you somehow think if God wants you to know He exists, He owes this to you. Right, right. Which is which is funny in a couple of reasons because they're going to make fun of Christians falsely because they think Christians actually think this for thinking that we're the center of the universe. Right. But what does that do? That makes Peter Bogosian literally the center of the universe where God mm -hmm. rearranges stars for him. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the, the only way he'll believe it, is if Peter Bogosian becomes the center of the universe, yeah. which is which is heavily problematic. But it but it also I mean at one point I want to I want to say look 
what would convince Peter Bogosian personally is irrelevant, right? It doesn't matter, right? He might be convinced if he has a near-death experience. It might, yeah. not ta- it might not actually take the stars rearranging. And, and if he sees the stars rearranging, that might convince him. That might not convince him. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the, the, the thing is that when he sets up his epistemology, right, Peter Bogosian has said this, and so has David McAfee, and so has most of these people, that, that and, I, and I, this, is just, this is basically rehashing my last episode uh, of, of the podcast, they've set up their epistemology to be, well, any natural explanation is more plausible than any supernatural explanation, right? Uh, Tracy Harris on, on the Atheist Experience says this all the time, right? Why, why would you resort to an invisible sky daddy? Why would you invo- resort to an unknown God as an explanation when you can just resort to, to natural explanations like delusion or hallucination mm-hmm. or aliens or the, 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 the favorite one, I don't know. Right, because they always say, "I don't know" is the more humble one. Right, you sh- you should say, if yeah. you don't know something, rather than rather than saying God did it, right? Because they think it's God of the gaps, which it's not. Rather than saying that, why don't you just say, "I don't know," but hopefully science will figure it out one day. So if you look at Peter Bogosian and say, "Well, in all of those cases, why would you assume God rather than a natural explanation? Even if it's even if it's the stars rearranging, why wouldn't you say you know it was mass hallucination? Why wouldn't you say it's delusion?" Why wouldn't you say you're, you're, you're in an alien matrix? Or why wouldn't you just say, I don't know, and, and you know, human minds are, are pattern-seeking things, and they'll find patterns where there aren't patterns, and so in the sky I saw Yahweh exists, but I imposed the pattern because my mind wants to find the pattern like seeing a face on a mountain. Yeah, and I usually throw these kinds of people who are loops. Ms. Munker is our say, yeah, um, I don't accept a natural or supernatural distinction. Yeah. As you put it, you need to argue for me that such a thing even really exists and, and that's when things get even more confusing you know I'll just say something like okay how about some like um, triangularity <clears throat> is that natural or is it supernatural right right what about the number three yeah <laughs> I mean it's just yeah it's and but again you know they're not trained mm-hmm. uh well and we shouldn't even say trained they don't have to be trained they're just they're just not they're just not well versed they just haven't been for for saying that they're critical thinkers and 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 quote unquote free thinkers and skeptics mm. and you know they don't go in authority and they think for themselves they just they they don't think for themselves. Why I mean, do all the free thinkers I meet think exactly alike? Exactly. The, why do they say almost the exact same cliches? Yeah. Word for word, the exact same thing. Uh, it, it, it's to the point. Of, like, can we go ahead and speed this argument because I know your argument. I know what you're going to say. I know it better than you're going to say it right now. So can we please just go and. And report, report some argument. Like, yeah, yeah. Has you ever considered that? And I'm thinking, actually, I was just sitting around waiting for you to finally mention that because I was getting bored here waiting on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and a lot of times it's just it's just it, it it's not even well thought out. Like they're not they're not parroting Graham Oppie. Yeah. Right. They're not parroting Thomas Nagel. They're not they're not they're not parroting Matteo Pigliucci. Right. Yeah. They're they're parroting uh, John Loftus. Yeah. And and David McAfee. Right. They're they're parroting those types of people. Uh, and and it's a lot of times it's just so it's so trivial, um, or or the or the and my favorite one is when they're parroting people like you know Dorothy Murdoch <laughs> or oh, something gosh. like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I got in a discussion with someone and and uh, they say you know the Bible has been disproven because because it because it borrows from other ancient Near Eastern sources. Mm-hmm. And I'm like you need you need to hash that out because if you were to put that in a syllogism, it does not follow. Therefore, the Bible is false. Right, that that's not the con- even if even if you grant that it borrows from from other sources, that that's that that's a that's a long road to hoe to get to. Therefore, the Bible is false. All you have to do is read and understand the first thing about polemics and how ancient Near Eastern sources used polemics, and and it, that that train's just derailed. When you talk about the uh, people of a parrot, one name has to be mentioned specifically: Richard Carrier. Yeah, who is the end all of biblical scholarship as we all know I, I like to often make the the statement and I, even a lot of my Catholic friends like it I say Carrier has spoken the case is closed yeah it's uh, and and Carrier uh, I mean I don't even know where, where do you start uh, I, I'm avoiding going into his his you know his appeal for a date recently on his website, 
Um, well, well, I shouldn't even say appeal for a date. Appeal for a new sex partner on his yeah, website. My, my, my wife, uh, sorry, because someone actually made a YouTube video of reading the whole thing. Yeah. So it, that is just creepy. Yeah. It, it, and look, it doesn't make him wrong. It, I mean, it doesn't make his arguments wrong, right, that, that, he's, that he's, you know, polyamorous. Uh, but part of me just wants to, you know, again, he's trying to cast this image of himself as a scholar, as an academic. Mm-hmm. Right. So why do you use your quote unquote academic blog uh, as a place to try to find a new sex partner? Right. Go, mm-hmm. go, go. There's websites for that. Go there. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I read his website because, you know, uh, I'm I punish myself sometimes. Uh, but, you know, I read it because I want to know, you know, what what's he writing? He tends to be the leading voice on the mythicist. Mm-hmm. So I want to know some of his articles. And when I when I see something like that, I'm like, uh, you know. How how do you expect people to take you seriously as an academic when you do stuff like that? Even P. Z. Myers had strong words on that one. Yeah, that I mean that's just not the that's not the platform for mm-hmm. it. Um, so not that there should be a platform for polyamorous uh, dating ads, but uh, but yeah. So when you read when you read Richard Carrier, he gets he gets passed on a lot because I mean and part of that is you know he 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 is a good writer he's he's well spoken uh, of all the mythicists he's going to be the one that's the most interested in uh you know academic tone and research uh him and price um but but he's one of the top ones because really he's one of the only ones I mean mm-hmm. if if you're going to quote someone on mythicism you have carrier and price Mm-hmm. Unless you just want to go completely, you know, bat crazy and and quote Murdoch and Fitzgerald and people like that, uh, which mm-hmm. people do, um, but you know, and mm-hmm. le- unless you're a zeitgeistian type of type of uh, mythicist, you really only have Carrier. So, yeah. and if someone wants to hear more about the bankruptcy of mythicist arguments, I did talk a little bit about this when I appeared on Atheist Analysis, and I debated Ken Humphreys on The Mind Renewed about this topic and they, they interviewed me later on but I remember when I was on Atheist Analysis they were asking me what percentage of New Testament scholars held the Mephesis and they said it's got to be like what 8% go lower 3% lower still okay okay what kind of number are you talking about and I said that's probably point zero 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 one percent yeah, so, and so many I could see the howling going on in the chat feature me and Bobby now, <clears throat> sorry guys but you don't know the arguments this isn't a debate it's like saying that if you go into the uh, biological field that so many, so many of the scientists are still debating is evolution true or not I mean whether it is or isn't most of them are pretty convinced that it is it's not a big debate going on but right it, it's it's the same kind of mindset taking place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like to point out there there are literally quite quite literally more Holocaust deniers in academia than there are Jesus mythicists. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it, it is more academic respectable to deny that the Holocaust exists or happened than it is to, to deny that Jesus existed. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's literally how bad and unconvincing the arguments are. Um, it's it's just it's just crazy, and it's not because, like people say, it's not because, um, you know, all all New Testament historians are are biased Christians. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it it's not that way at all. I mean, Jesus mysticism had its heyday, and it was called the 1900s. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it was just it's so long ago, and it's been so long disproven and abandoned that there that there's just no one no one buys anymore. It, it's the same as the as that old you know the the myth of the warfare between science and religion. Right. Right. You're, you unless you're reading you know White back in the 1800s, mm-hmm. right? No no historian of science and religion holds to that paradigm anymore. It's been so disproven uh, that 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 no one who knows anything about it holds that. It's just it's just so it's just as as almost as wrong as wrong can be, and yet this is what quote unquote skeptics buy into. You know, since we talked about the Bible some, we should get into the major area here of this. And this is something that when I was on your show we definitely talked about this. And that's McCaffrey's claim that the Bible is literally the word of God. Yeah. yeah. Now what now some people are hearing this and might think, 
Well, yeah, the Bible is the Word of God. What's the problem with saying that? Right, right. The the problem is with <clears throat> with the word literal, right? And it and this is this is a problem among Christians. I mean, my yeah. my, I got my degree from Moody Bible. Yep. Right. Which, if anyone knows anything about Moody Bible, if you hear that, you're probably thinking, "Oh my gosh, Tyler is a you know a dispensational uh, you know Christian." My uh, hope is built on nothing less than <laughs> Scofield Notes and Moody Press. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I I went to Moody, and I was you know I'm I'm a Reformed Presbyterian. I'm I'm a millennialist. I'm I'm a partial preterist, right? I, I'm Amen, I, brother. I, you know, I, I'm I'm a I'm a, you know five point Calvinist. I'm I was I was let's just say I was the odd duck at Moody, mm-hmm. right? A big point of dispensationalism is the literal hermeneutic, mm-hmm. right? That is, you take the literal reading of of the text. Right, even for dispensationalists, they don't mean by literal what most new atheists mean by literal. Mm-hmm. Right, when when we're talking about literal, right, and I say we, I mean I'm I'm talking about just Christians generally. I'm even including dispensationalists by by literal. Even if I disagree with the literal hermeneutic of dispensationalism, we still mean something along the lines of like something like the actual meaning of the text. Right, it still accounts for metaphor. Still accounts yeah. for symbolism, right? You just you, it, if it if it comes across as clear history and there's no reason to take it as metaphor or symbolism, you don't take it as metaphor and symbolism. That's mm-hmm. basically what that is. If there's if there's a, you know good reason to take it as metaphor or symbolism, you do take it as metaphor or symbolism, yeah. or or as you know hanging on ancient hooks like John Walton says, or, or some. I mean, there's all kinds of options for for someone like McAfee. They mean something like you should read it as woodenly literal as possible, yes. right? With no nuance, no context, no history, no. I mean, he couldn't. He couldn't. You know, read the first uh, the first definite article in Greek or Hebrew if if it hit him over the head. Uh, th- there's nothing. Else. It it is this. They they want to read it like a modern scientific manual textbook uh, or, or technical handbook of some kind. Um, and that's that's just not what any Christian means by the text. So when McAfee's interacting with these texts and he says, "Well, look at this," right? So so a good example is is when Elijah calls the bears down. Mm-hmm. He looks at it, and 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 some translations say, you know, use. Yeah. And so for him, a literal reading is what we mean today by use. Mm-hmm. Right, right. When really the word can go to someone up in their mid twenties. The fact that forty two of them were mauled. Right means there's a lot more. We're talking about we're talking about a mob of brigands here. We're not, and there's a whole bunch yeah. of other things that go on. We're not talking about like a t-ball team of, of right. little like toddlers, right? That's just not what we're talking about. But for him, he wants a literal interpretation of the English translation, mm-hmm. right? Usually of the King James version. Yeah, I hear what you're saying about Moody, because for a while I was a student at SES, and I'm an Orthodox preterist. No, I'm not Calvinist, but I'm an Orthodox preterist. I'm hold a more post millennial or millennial position, which was very amusing one night when we didn't have our regular teacher for class and we ended up playing Eschatars G Jeopardy when it the <laughs> students found out that I was an all millennial post millennial kind of guy. The professor was saying, Guys, you can't uh, can't be letting the all millennial here be beating you, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, it, and, it's and, I mean like I, I disagreed with many of the positions from there and I was still a student in fact I'd say I've, at every school I've been to I've pretty much disagreed with the positions a lot of times but it doesn't change the fact that I'm still learning there and we've had Harley Ordway on the show and she's certainly an expert on literature and what she's yeah. pointed out is that the term literal really refers to according to the intent of the offer. Right. But when you're dialoguing with internet atheists, it's this idea that God should be clear. And by clear, it means what a 21st century modern Westerner would think. I used right. to say, okay, clear to who? Modern Westerners, 17th century Chinese, 14th century Japanese, 11th century Frenchmen, 8th century Germans. I mean, how far do we go? Why should it be specially geared towards us and no one else? Right. Yeah, I, I forget who I got who I got this from. This isn't this isn't original to me. Someone said it, but if, but if I were to come to you and I said I went to a concert last night and the whole town came out, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. What what's the literal meaning of that? It, it the literal meaning is that it, you know 
the the intention is it was really crowded. Like there was a mm-hmm. lot of people out there, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> it doesn't mean uh, that literally every single person from the entire town went to the concert. Yeah. Or if we can, if someone says, my whole world feels like it's falling apart. It doesn't mean they're looking at us saying, whoa, look at all those cracks showing up in the ground right now. Right. Right, right. They're not Chicken Little saying the sky is falling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of times people will come to me and they'll say, well, geez, the thing is, it's just arbitrary. I mean, how do you know what's literal and how do you know what isn't? And I'll just say, how do you know it was Shakespeare? How yeah. do you know it was Homer? How do you know it when you're reading the newspaper in the morning? Right, right. It, yeah, it, it's com- but the, But again, you know, this, this is going to come back to that rhetoric, and they're going to say, "Well, well, if it's the inspired word of God, oh yeah, right, it should just be clear. Why do you Why do you need to study? They're going to They're going to fall back on that. Why You know, Why do you need to study the Greek? Why do you need to study the context? It should just be clear, right? He should have told them about quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Or even going back to Carrier, they just claim it. God should have told them about personal hygiene and washing hands. Right. And so why would that even be in there? I mean, do you know how many years this would be put down and <clears throat> people are translating it and not having a clue what is being talked about entirely? And in that kind of age, when you did writing like that, that just wasn't something that you did. Right. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, comes, there's comes a certain point where if, you know, if it's so disanalogous to their experience, mm-hmm. right, it, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to show as revelation. It's going to show as, as, Madness. I mean, there's a certain point where re- revelation does have to be couched in the culture to even to even make inroads, mm-hmm. right? If, I mean, if it was if it was talking about quantum mechanics, they're they're just not in a place to even to even understand it, let alone <clears throat> you know have the framework to test for it. Mm-hmm. So it, it, if that's going to come off as complete madness in the incidentals, right? How is then the religious significance, the redemptive significance, going to come off? Right? They're they're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, and. When it comes to this kind of topic, I see the same old lines thrown out every single time. Once again, I'm saying, Dude, this is getting boring. Okay, because they're saying, look, these accounts were written decades later by anonymous sources who weren't even eyewitnesses. Like, okay, right. which focus, which problem there do you want to deal with first? Because there's right. so much of that's problematic. Right, right. Yeah, and if, and if you say, you know, ha- have you read Richard Bauckham? Right. Right? Uh, you know, no, I don't, I don't need to read one of those biased theologians. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it's, just, it's just insulating their, their bias. I wrote, uh, I wrote an article on the Dunning-Kruger effect, mm-hmm. uh, as, I, as I saw, you know, it on David McAfee. And, and, and the Dunning-Kruger effect, for those who aren't listening, is basically uh, certain people, it's not all bias, it's not all ignorance, but there's a certain kind of ignorance where <clears throat> or a certain type of being unskilled where you're unskilled in the exact area that you would need to be skilled in to know that you're unskilled mm-hmm. right uh, and 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 David McAfee there's like seven features of this and and David exhibits all seven of them uh, to a T in published work right I'm not saying like you know from private conversations I'm quoting him. I'm saying this is where he says that he's an expert. This is where he says that the other experts aren't actually experts. That that they disagree with him because they're too biased, right? This this is where right all this kind of stuff goes through, and I show all the all the published links to it. And and when you talk to David or you talk to these other people, that I often sit there and I think you know if if you weren't so biased in this exact area, you'd be willing to read the people who disagree with you, that right. would help you overcome your bias. Right. But because you're biased exactly at that point, it keeps you from actually overcoming your bias or even recognizing that you are biased. Right? It, it's, this, it's this horrible catch-22. And, there, and there's, I, I mean, if, if, if you or any of your listeners have, like, you know, a, a tool to really break that nut, uh, anything would be helpful. I, I mean, there are some people where I just talked to uh, and and it's just sad. You just you sit there and you're just like, oh my gosh, like you don't know how how biased you are. And I'm not saying this because I dis because I disagree with them. I don't, you know, I can I could talk to someone like Graham Oppie all day and be completely, you know, enthralled. And, and you know, I think he's wrong. Uh, but but that doesn't mean that that I think that he suffers from this type of thing. Because a lot of times they're going to say, oh, well, you're just saying that to anyone who disagrees with you. Because as a Christian, you're you know you can't. You can't think of, you know, anyone possibly disagreeing with you or understanding because you're so biased, 
Right? And it's, well, well, no, it's it's you know I have no problem reading Nagel and Pigliucci and Oppie and others. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's people like McAfee, uh and 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 Fitzgerald and Murdoch and 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 yeah. and, and Harris and mm-hmm. uh, Dawkins and those type of people that that you know that get I me. You mean people are coming mean and you say, well, you should read such and such, then. And I say, okay. Here's a link to the review of that book that you said that I should read that I've already written here because right. I've already read the book because I'm like you, I'm not afraid to read books that disagree with me. And if you are really so sure your position is true and so sure the other position is false, go ahead and take it on then. It shouldn't be a burden at all. And usually when I encounter these people, I always ask this question and and I say 99.9% of the time I get crickets chirping as an answer and say and ask them okay when was the last time you read a scholarly work on the topic that disagreed with you right right yeah and half the time I'm getting to the point where I just want to say when was the last time you read a scholarly article (laughs) full stop Uh, not even one that disagrees with you just even even one that just you know I, I just want to be like put Put internetinfidels.com down and walk away. Like just mm-hmm. step away slowly. Uh, you know, you know, just just close close the web browser that he's, he has evilbible.com or Iron Chariots on there. Just just close that down for a minute. Walk away. Like go go get a book yeah. or something. Um, yeah, it's it's just it's 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 kind of just bad. And there's a certain point where I'd be like, look, and if you don't have the time <clears throat> or you don't have the interest, just say that. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, there there are topics that that interest me that I just don't have time to study. Right. I don't have time, but I I don't go into discussion boards dedicated to that and tell people that disagree with my my pretty uneducated opinion that they're stupid. Mm-hmm. Right. I, yeah. I mean, I I I know I'm really interested in in World War Two. Right. It's it's a fascinating topic. I I read a lot on World War One, but I don't read a lot on World War Two. I don't I don't I just don't have time for it. To you know, to read on all my interests, but I don't go into World War II discussion posts and and where there's disagreements and say you know I'm going to take one side, any side who disagrees with me is stupid or biased or wrong or you know yeah. I, I'm not going to go in there you know that assured of my position that everyone else must be wrong because I just haven't read and if you haven't read just admit that you haven't read and and move on but don't come in you know uh, yelling and mocking and cussing at people who disagree with you who have read. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm thinking right now that Peter Bogosian did have on his page once, his Facebook page, before I got banned, where he made a, a post about reading Bart Ehrman's misquoting Jesus and saying, the Christian apologists here aren't going to touch this one at all. We were all over that one immediately because most of us had already read misquoting Jesus and we could quote it better than our opponents could. Right. Yeah, because... Half the time, I mean, it's like, and this happens on both sides, right? This isn't just atheistic fundamentalism, right? right? If, if I'm Absolutely. sitting there, and, and you know, if I'm if I'm sitting there and I'm reading people um, who disagree with me on theological issues, you're going to have some people um, who who are just reading who are just reading books and picking out the quotes that they want or the points that they want. And they're completely ignoring nuance or disagreement. I mean, I, I've had people quote books, like like you said, where they quoted something and you're like, you realize the thesis of the book was the exact opposite of what you just said, right? Uh, I mean, I've had people do that. I've had people who are Jesus mythicists quote articles on the historical Jesus and, and pull facts out of that and say, see, therefore Jesus was a myth. Right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, you know, it happens on all sides, mm-hmm. but for some reason, on this kind of internet infidel, atheistic fundamentalist, the frequency of it is just is just staggeringly high. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. One other area we should talk about, some we kind of got into it a little bit, is that in internet atheism, science is the end all of everything. Scientism yeah. rules the day. Yeah, yeah, and it a lot of time it's not it's not science, right? <clears throat> I mean they're not uh, they're they're they say they love science they say you know it's, it, it's not they don't it's not science I mean it's it's it's, uh, it, it's this it's this scientism like you said it's it's actually uh, a worldview it's, it's an epistemology where um, it, it's it's basically the 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 return of logical positivism. 
Uh, it's kind of a, a neo-logical positivism that, that's rearing its head again that, that has been long dead. Mm-hmm. Um, just like they're dragging out Jesus mythicism from you know the 19th century, they're dragging out logical positivism uh, from the early 20th century, uh, even though it's been long, long dead and gone. And and they act like this is just you know uh, this is just what reason is. This this you know this is just what logic is, right? Yeah. Uh, you know science just is this mm-hmm. when when it's when it's really really not. Yeah, I, I find it amusing when I get the claim that I'm anti-science. I don't know many Christians that I'm interacting with that are anti-science. I'm all for going out there and doing the scientific research. I remember one internet atheist who was on Unbelievable even, when we were discussing on the thread after a show on the premier community, he put up a link to a theory about the universe, and yeah, what do you think about this? And I said, well, it's not my area, but I think it's an interesting scientific idea, and it's well worth research and funding, so we should look into it. Yeah, and I'm sure that's not the argument that or the reply that was expected. It was more, like, oh, this is more of a godless stuff out there that's trying to deny the obvious. And no, this is a scientific theory. Let's look into it. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times what <clears throat> what they're saying, you know, this is science. A lot of times I don't say, well, no, it, it's not science. That's actually a philosophical construct. That's you know that you're interpreting certain data with. Mm-hmm. Right, that that you're not doing science. Science isn't isn't you know it might be in you know the experiments or the data might be informing your belief about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know I, I'm not sure your position on it, but whenever I hear someone bring up the multiverse, I'd be like, you're not doing science. You're doing metaphysics. Mm-hmm. That's it, a very different thing. <laughs> uh, you know you're not, you're not. Uh, when they talk about you know quantum indeterminacy. Probably gonna step on some toes here, but when you say that you know quantum indeterminacy is is, is uh, you know that is a, a, an um, a, you know an ontological principle, right? You're not doing science. You're doing metaphysics. Uh, you know if, if you're saying it's fully indeterminate or it's fully deterministic, those are interpretation of the data, right? You're you're making certain philosophical arguments and assumptions about it, and you're coming to certain arguments. That's you know which is fine. It's not a bad thing. Just don't call just don't call it what science is. Or, or don't say, you know, science trumps philosophy. Yeah, I'm thinking right now of a, a brilliant mind, no doubt, Stephen Hawking. I mean, yeah. when he shows up from a Big Bang Theory, I find it hysterical, yeah. for instance. And, of course, I mean the TV show, not the theory itself. Yeah. That he writes in his book, The Grand Design, Philosophy is Dead. I'm like, look, Dr. Hawking, you know science. Is I'm not going to go against you at all in science you'd trounce me easily yeah but that kind of statement that 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 itself is a philosophical statement yeah about reality you're just not thinking properly in that area yeah and then and then he goes the entire book is uh, is is philosophy yeah I, I mean the entire book is is setting up a a, a model of of a view of reality that, that, that is interpreting the data. The entire book, he says philosophy is dead and then goes and spends 200-something pages doing philosophy. Pretty poorly, but he's doing it. What people don't realize is really philosophy, and I'd even add in theology, are really unavoidable. Yeah. The question is, just, are you going to do good philosophy or bad philosophy? I, I've had these conversations with my wife where I've said, and everyone is a theologian, really. Everyone, even the atheist, is a theologian because they're very specific about what kind of god or gods they don't believe in. Yeah. But the question is, are you going to do good theology or bad theology? And it's the same with philosophy. Are you going to do good philosophy or bad philosophy? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely uh, interesting to talk to them to talk to the kind of internet. Infidel atheists and and you know they'll they'll mock and ridicule theology, but then when they start talking about God and just like you 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 realize that's what you're doing you're doing philosophy or you're doing theology that's what you're 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 talking and thinking about God that's all theology is theology doesn't have to be orthodox right right it, I mean theolo- theology just is the act of thinking and reasoning about God uh, and yeah. spiritual matters yeah Graham Oppie does theology to an extent and he yep. has to yeah In, anytime you're making arguments for against about god you know <clears throat> uh, anything like that uh, you're you're doing theology you're doing philosophical theology maybe but you're doing theology yeah and when we're talking about science theory 
an area that has to be covered is this myth, and yes, I've seen it on Loftus's page as well, and I was so pleased to see that Tim O'Neill especially think, showed up and really went after him on this, and this is the idea that the medieval period was the so-called Dark Ages, yeah. where the church ruled the world and held science in its grip, and we're so anti-science, and we see this with Copernicus and Galileo and which I'm saying, you know what, Galileo wasn't the medieval period, but let, let, let's just, you know, ignore the facts here. <laughs> yeah. And well, such. it's like when they say that, you know, Jesus is a Bronze Age preacher. I mean, it's just, you know, mm-hmm. you're just ignoring it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's that, it's that whole, um, it's that whole warfare or conflict thesis between science and religion mm-hmm. that, I'm sorry, just no, no uh, actual scholar of, of science or religion and the interplay holds to anymore. I mean, if you read uh, Ronald Numbers or David Lindbergh or Alan Chapman or, or any of any of the, these types of scholars, they, they just point out it, it, that that's that type of that type of model is so skewed. Um, yet, yeah, was there conflict from time to time? Sure, but it actually it, it was funny. A lot of times, it was actually because the church was defending contemporary science. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, uh, it, it, the, the problem was, wasn't that the church was against science. It was that the church was defending, you know, uh, Ptolemy, right? Mm-hmm. It, they, they were defending Platonism, which was held to by the best scientists of the day, right? I mean, that, that's just what yeah. they were doing. I think um, it was more Aristotle than Plato, but... This point yeah, okay. Things. But, yeah, so, I mean, the... the so when, when Galileo comes along, which is also funny because they want to say, well, Galileo was, you know... He was arrested for for proposing that uh, heliocentrism was true and geocentrism was false, which you know Copernicus had no problems <laughs> saying it a long time before he did. Uh, and they they missed. Well, no, I mean the problem with Galileo is that he was a jerk, right. uh, and and that he publicly mocked the Pope mm-hmm. uh, in, in in written work that he was told not. I mean that does that make the, does that mean that the Church was innocent? Well, no, they were being authoritarian, and 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 yeah, they, I mean there's other problems, but it had nothing to do with his science. Right. And his scientific arguments at the time, they really weren't even that good. I no, mean, they we were pretty found, bad. We found out later on that, yes, he was right, but he wasn't. We shouldn't believe he was right because his evidence was so strong. It really wasn't. But he he was allowed to keep doing his research still. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think one of his arguments was um, that we know... Yeah, we know the Earth orbits the Sun because because of the tides, right? It wasn't because the tides aren't because of the Moon. The, the tides are because the Earth is moving and sloshing around. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's not the best argument. Yeah. Something interesting we can talk about with science, and this gets us back to the Bible again, is it, it, it really gives me a, a kick when people are, you know and say things like, "Well, today we know that virgins don't give birth, and that people don't walk on water, and that." People who are dead don't come back to life. And I'm hearing all this and thinking, you really think back then people didn't know that stuff? Right. They knew right. what it takes to make a baby. Right. And they buried their dead because they said they weren't coming back. And they built boats so they could walk on water. So it, it I mean, you can say miracles are false, but you don't say, well, we don't believe in that stuff anymore because we have science. Right. Yeah, it's always funny because like we we know now that people don't walk on water. People didn't walk on water back then either. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean that, and and they they want to say, well, we know that you know it it doesn't happen, right? It, it well, we believe that it doesn't happen naturally either. Yeah. Right. It, there, you know, it there it can't happen by the laws of nature. You, mm-hmm. That's you, that's right. <laughs> no one's yeah. saying that it can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's 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 pretty it's pretty mis pretty mis misinformed misleading. It's it's it, a lot of times. Uh, it's just kind of a straw man of the position. You can't if they can't engage with the argument. It's going to be a really uh, kind of caricature of what the what the position actually is. Yeah, and when people are making this kind of claim, okay, okay, let's talk about resurrection, for instance. Since you're saying we know it's now, uh, when did science establish that dead people stay dead? Who was this guy who made this great discovery, and how how where has it been up here? Because I mean, you could li- hear what I'm saying. Like, we are geez, and if that's stupid, no one made that discovery. We already knew that. Like, right. Yeah. That's the point. We knew it. Even right. the Jews knew it. Right. And and there's, you know, 
Yeah. I mean, they're they're not necessarily known for their consistency, yeah. but there's a certain point where we say, look, based on modern medicine, how much better are we at reviving people to life now than we were 500 years ago? Yeah. Right now, I think we can, you know, with with certain you know, people can be dead for for minutes, uh, and we can we have techniques and stuff to bring them back to life, uh, and and you know, there, there's a certain point where we say, well, you know, why can't why can't God? Yeah. Right. When it, when when I say even the Jews knew that dead people stay dead, I mean, I'm saying it that way because many of the Jews, not all of them, of course, but many of them did believe in resurrection. And even still, they were burying their dead because they were saying, that resurrection, yeah, we believe in it. It's going to come at the end. It's certainly not going to happen right now. Right, right, yeah. But, I mean, you know, we have to remember we're dealing with people who think that they're, you know, the disciples of the data, right? These, these are the people who think that they're, you know, the bearers of logic and reason. Mm -hmm. But when you push them, right, they're going to they're gonna deny the foundations of logic. So when you bring up presuppositionalism, they're not going to be able to ground logic. To the point where you get to people like Krauss, uh, who in his debate with, with William Lynn Craig basically shows why you can't trust logic, right? Mm -hmm. So, so when, when, when you're dealing with these people, you have to realize there, there's, there's, it's so amorphous, right? The positions are always changing. The rhetoric is always they're, – they're, they're just trying to find anything to kind of pin God against the wall, that they'll use anything, whatever, no matter how contradictory it is to other positions that they have. That they're, that they're willing to, you know, cut off their nose to spite their face, even if that means denying logic itself. I find it amusing also when I'm told that I'm holding my position for strong emotional yeah. reasons, and I'm so scared to think outside of the box. I mean, do you have any idea that sometimes I could just very easily say my life could be so much easier if Christianity wasn't true? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and that, and that that I mean, there's so many things like that. Apparently, you know, apparently all believers are only believers because they're raised and indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. And I want to be like, yeah, I've raised my hand. I'm, you know, I, I didn't come believer until I was 20. Not in a Christian household. Mm -hmm. Well, you were raised in a Christian context. Nah, I mean, the area I was living in, like six percent church. I can't even think of a person I knew that was a Christian in in high school. Like nothing. I got mm -hmm. nothing, literally. Uh, and when and when you when you talk to them, it's just it's just you know everything. It's it's a, okay. Well, then it's just emotional reasons. I mean, if we want to play that kind of psychologizing game, then I could look at you and I could say, well, you don't believe in God because you want to be an autonomous law unto yourself. It's just emotional reasons, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if we really want to play the psychologizing game, yeah. uh, and we both think we're true, they, they think that it's true that, you know, I, I believe for emotional reasons. I actually do think it's true that we, we, we don't believe because we're, we want our autonomy. That's sin. Uh, so, you know, but, but that's not the way that argument happens. That's not the way that you debate yeah. these issues. Even if I think it's true, that doesn't mean I'll present it as an argument. Yeah. And I don't pull out a card of emotion until I see my opponent do something that certainly displays some sort of emotion that's way intense beyond anything we'd expect. The, the problem is, it's difficult enough for a trained counselor skilled in psychology and such to diagnose their their patient who's sitting right there in the office with them, who they can interact with in person and ask in-depth questions to. It's difficult enough to diagnose them right there, but you think five minutes of having an internet conversation and by God, you're sufficient to do the job. Right, right, yeah. It, it's, yeah, and I mean, I I try to avoid it no matter what. It's very rare. The only time I ever bring it up is is you know I I occasionally I'll talk to someone and they're just they're clearly so <clears throat> so angry about yeah. Christianity, so hostile, so just so full of of hatred and anger and stuff. And I just at that point I'm just saying I'm, I'm sorry you're so angry. Like I, I you know. Yeah. I'm trying to have this reasonable discussion with you, but you know, I, it must be something must have really bad happened for you to be this angry, uh, this hostile, this this this, this filled with this much hate toward towards me, a person you don't you actually don't know. We've talked to you for 15 minutes, and yet you you feel the need to you know cuss and rail and insult my family, and I mean all that kind of you know. Literally, I've had people say that I should be dragged out and shot. I mean, it, yeah. it's those types of things. Uh, and I just, I, I just want to be like, you know, whatever happened, I'm sorry. Like that's, I, I'm, you know, I don't know what happened, but you know, you're, you're expressing a lot of anger. Remember, those people are also going out later on, championing the virtues of tolerance. 
Right. Oh yeah, a lot of times, and, and championing the fact that they won. Right. Right. The, the you know they won the debate. I usually the main time that I get to it is when I've dealt with someone who know me enough, and it's apparent they don't know what they're talking about, and it's apparent to everyone else as well. And then it just becomes okay. Now I'm going to make just start making jokes about how ridiculous your position is because frankly. It's embarrassing, and I think you should be embarrassed to hold it the way you're holding it. Yeah. Well, and and going all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning, I mean, the sad thing is is that so many people in groups like McAfee's don't recognize how ridiculous these positions are. They don't. They they, they jump on, and they jump on the bandwagon uh, with, with insult. So, you know, someone will say something ridiculous, and everyone will jump in and be like, oh, that, that Theus, look how stupid he is. Look, look you know, all this kind of stuff. And I would be like, do you... Do you realize what you're what you're agreeing? Like, do you realize what you just said uh, that you agreed with? Yeah. You know it, that that's the type of position you're going to applaud for. You know mm-hmm. that I mean that says that says more about you than it does yeah. about me. Uh, I'm looking at this thing. I'm over here. I'm not even flinching at this. I mean, the, the, these arguments they've been going on for so long in your position. I've dealt with it so much. As I said, frankly. It's getting kind of boring, and you're treating it like it's some sort of trump card out there. Yeah, like like it like it's it's the death blow. Right. right? I, I, a lot of times, and a lot of times they're just characters, a straw man. And so I say, you know, I I know you think you you think you're throwing haymakers, but you're actually just punching hay. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it's just it's 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 so bad a lot of times, and a lot of times they can just be pointed out and say, can you know, I'll ask them, you know, can you point one one scholar that agrees with you? Mm-hmm. Can you just give me a citation? Right. Right. Uh, and you know, sometimes they can if they're talking about mythicism. They'll cite Carrier. That's fine. But a, a lot of the times, the things that are being said, you won't find any academic. You won't find any scholars saying any of it. And that's not an appeal to you know authority saying you know a scholar must be right. It's just you know ha- have you actually researched it? Can you name anyone who agrees with you? Yeah. In and, print. And when it comes to Carrier, I mean, I can say people like you and I. Most likely, we've read more of Carrier than many of his own fans who are quoting him in these arguments have read. Me. I've got his book right here on the historicity of Jesus. I've read the whole thing already. Right. right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I, I mean, there's. I, I think that I've probably read more Dawkins than most of these people have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think a lot of these, a lot of the 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 people like on on David's page and stuff. Maybe have read, uh, you know, the God Delusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really doubt they've read things like Climbing Mountain Probable, The Selfish Gene, right, Unweaving the Rainbow. Or right? I, I really doubt they've read these things um, mm-hmm. when I talk to them. And and the funny thing is, is that you know, I, I I've actually been in conversations with them, and and they don't even under, understand things like evolution. They right. they don't understand, even though I disagree with Dawkins. A lot of the times I see they don't even understand Dawkins. Right. right. They they don't understand Dawkins' major argument of the mm-hmm. God delusion. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, they 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 think that that Dawkins is is trying to argue that God doesn't exist. Right. Which which is not even Dawkins' argument. Right. He he's arguing that God probably doesn't exist, which is a completely different argument. Mm-hmm. So it, it's when you read it, you just want to say, well, you know, you guys haven't even read uh, or, or don't understand even your own authors, which is sad. Yeah. And I'm thinking right now about how, for my arguments for God, I tend to rely on the Thomistic ways of Thomas Aquinas, and I'll present those in a form, and usually the main answer, main response is, where, geez, this just doesn't answer the question of who made God. Yeah. If you understood Thomas's argument at all, you would know that's a laughable question to be asking at this point. Yeah. Yeah, and you'll <clears throat> you'll hear some people say, well, the only reason why you say, you know, that 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 God is 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 uh, eternal or something is to escape that question. Well, no, I mean that's that's been that's been the theology for thousands of years. It, it's not in response to some 21st century, you know, internet internet skeptic uh, objection to the argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, and it's also really funny because one of the things that I found that's pretty successful <clears throat> is uh, I'll, I'll argue the Kalam. Okay. And point out, look, as an atheist, as a skeptic, uh, you should actually accept the Kalam. 
right? The, 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 the problem with the Kalam is, is that God is lurking in the wings, right? Mm-hmm. The conclusion of the Kalam argument is not that God exists. Right. Right? The conclusion of the Kalam argument is that the universe has a cause. Mm-hmm. Right? God doesn't come in until we say, okay, what type of features would that cause have? Right? Mm-hmm. That's where God comes in. But I look at the atheists and I say, look, you're spinning your wheels. So much trying to deny things like causation, which is uh, you know a first principle of metaphysics. It's required for you to even do science, right? Why waste all your time arguing against the thing, making yourself look so foolish arguing against causation, when you can just accept the kalam and then argue the the further point of the argument, yeah, right? And but they have no interest. They, they it, you know they want to they want to stop God as early on as possible. Yeah, when we start talking about these lines along the historical Jesus and dealing with mythicism, I've made the statement many times when I can inform myself that, you know, there are many atheists who admit the existence of a historical Jesus and go on to lead happy and meaningful lives. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's 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 ridiculous sometimes, just the way that their their rhetoric uh falls out and and, and you know. It's frustrating to, to talk to them. I mean, it's it's a it's a useful ministry. It's helpful. Um, you know, it definitely it definitely has its its, its purpose in the church. I mean, uh, I, I've I've seen people you know come to come to repentance and be saved through through this type of ministry. Uh, I've seen people move away from atheistic fundamentalism. Maybe they're they're on their way. You don't know what type of seeds are being planted. Right. Um, you don't know you know what barrier to to theism you might have knocked down. That ten years down the road, someone's going to come along. Uh, and, and your seeds go out. You just don't know, but it's a really, really helpful ministry. We're like we're like the backhoe that's clearing out the weeds mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the time um, for these. And, and a lot of times, what I've actually found, and and this is this is important, I think, for anyone who gets into this type of ministry, is chances are you don't want to say that God can't work, right? But chances are the person that God is going to convict and use your ministry for is not the person that, that's posting these types of things on the website. Absolutely. It's not going to be the people that are screaming and cussing and yelling at you. It's going to be the people that are IMing you and messaging you on the side saying they're watching the debate yeah. uh, and they have further questions for you. The lurkers. Right? Yeah, it's going, to be, it's going to be those observers, those lurkers. It's going to be the balconiers uh, that, that, that uh, your ministry is going to have an impact on. Yeah, that's the reason why I do this kind of thing. And I also still, at this point, try to limit my time because I know there are many other people out there that are doing this thing. But when I'm entering these debates, some people say, well, do you really think that you're going to get the atheist to convert? I'm like, no. No, not at all. In fact, that's not even my goal right now. My goal is simply answer the question and show the charge is false. Right. That's it. I'm more interested in the people who are watching and giving a strong show for Christianity. And besides, the way I say, if these people are willing to come after me, and I'm someone who I think knows my stuff pretty well in this area, how much more likely are they going to come after someone who doesn't know their stuff? Like, say, my mother, for instance. Right. Right. I, I, I'm doing this for the Christians who can't defend themselves yet. Right. Right. And, and it, it also helps. It, it, it's helping kind of turn the tide of the of the culture's view of, of Christianity. Right. Uh, it, it helps turn the tide of the of the quality of Christian academics that are we we'll call it Christians that are going into academics. Uh, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely a, a very useful ministry, and, it, and it's kind of it's kind of sad that that people like you and I have to defend apologetics a lot of times oh, yes. to the church. That's hard. I mean, that that's something that 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 actually does kind of make me sad that that there are still mm-hmm. churches out there where where it has to be defended that you need to do apologetics. Yeah, right? yeah. I I've told Alex <clears throat> before, as I said, you know, if you're out there and you're doing a counseling ministry, which is excellent. <clears throat> yeah. You're going to say, oh, counseling, we need to do that. We need to be, hi- be behind that. If you're doing missionary work, oh, that's excellent. We need to be behind that. If you're doing a homeless ministry, oh, that's excellent. We need to be behind that. If you're doing an apologetics ministry, what's that, you wicked pagan heathens? You know, don't you know you're supposed to live by faith? Right. Right. Yeah. Or, or, or <laughs> you know, it's just kind of that, oh, that, that's sweet that you have a hobby. Right, <laughs> right. This is oh, that you know, that's that's that you're an academic. You think that way, so you know that's that's a that's a good that's a good hobby for you to be going and doing there. You know, mm-hmm. th- th- thanks for that, and that's it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say, okay, call it a hobby, or you want, let's see how quickly you're going to be calling me when, say, the Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, yeah. or when your son comes home from college and suddenly announces that he's become an atheist, right. and before too long, chances are you'll be calling me back, and you know, honestly, it, I, I wouldn't be saying, but I'd be, probably think, you know, if you can have kind of like inoculated the kid a little bit beforehand... Yeah, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Yeah, and there—I mean, there are some really good. There are some churches out there that are that are supporting it. I mean, I, I'm right. thankful that the church that I'm at. I teach adult Sunday school, and I actually went through a year-long curriculum on apologetics, uh, which was which was really good. You know that they that yeah. they supported that. You know, it's yeah. been a really supportive. There are some really good ones, but but yeah, I mean, we we should be encouraging you know other people. You know, start apologetics ministries at your church. You know, you don't have to do everything. I think Reasonable Faith has has uh, charters that that does a lot of the work, the back work for you. Um, there's a lot of things you do, and start it young. If you can do it with with elementary and junior high, and getting people to think reasonably, which again is is one of the funny things about uh, about kind of the new atheist thing, where where you know it's it's this is coming back to David McAfee and his belief book, where on the one hand, they want to say, well, you know, um, you're indoctrinated, you're taught to not ask questions and all this kind of stuff. And we say, well, no, you know, I teach apologetics. I, t- I teach kids how to to reason and think and, and analyze belief and ask questions. And we ask questions about our beliefs and stuff. And then you say, oh, well, then well, then it's just you're, you're just indoctrinating people to think like you think. Uh-huh. And, and it's like, well, well, did did you miss all that all that other stuff that that we we're talking about, right? I mean, you 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 mock people for not asking questions, uh, and then it, and it's still indoctrination when when we raise them to ask questions and to think critically and to and to read books and and all of that kind of stuff. But something like a belief book is not indoctrination at all. Oh yeah, clearly not. Clearly, clearly. and and this is the this is the book uh, that that is a complete caricature. Uh, of of religion and religious belief. I mean, so shallow, and it's meant for toddlers. Right. Right. He's trying to get kids. He shows pictures of people reading this belief book, which has a picture of of you know, I think it's Jesus, Satan, and is it Muhammad or, or Buddha or, or one of them? Uh, Probably not um, Muhammad. I'd say. I think uh, yeah, I think it's Jesus, uh, Buddha, and and then the devil uh, on the front, and it's meant it's meant to read to four, five, six year olds. Right mm-hmm. to get them to think that that religion is nonsense mm-hmm. from a young age, but that's not indoctrination. That's critical thinking. Mm-hmm. Well, we're getting to the a point where we do have to wrap things up. And Tara, you've talked some about your blog, your podcast, and such. Could you let people know where that is if they want to find out more about you? Yeah, absolutely. the The podcast is the Freed Thinker Podcast. Um, you can get it on iTunes. You can uh, get it on uh, uh, Stitcher, uh, and the podcast or the blog is the Freed Thinker Podcast. Um, mm-hmm. The the address is uh, freedthinkerpodcast.blogspot.com. Um, so you can you can view it there. Uh, I'm not I'm not always as active on the blog as I as I would like to be. Maybe. Um, so if you want to get in any of these discussions, you can come over uh, and join the Facebook group, the Freed Thinker Podcast Facebook group. Yeah, and uh, if anyone's interested also, I was on Tyler's show not too long ago talking about David McAfee as well, so you can go and find that link there too. Yep, yep, we did a, a little show on your review of his book. Yeah, and that's available on my own blog site. So, um, Tyler, do you have uh, any final words you'd like to leave for the Deeper Waters audience today? Uh, just encouraging people to to keep thinking and to keep asking questions and and to keep up. It's a it's a tough ministry to to be involved. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it does wear you down hearing the same bad argument mm-hmm. over and 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 over again. Uh, it it can wear you down, but just to you know spend time. Uh, make sure you stay plugged into church. Spend time in the words so that you're getting refreshed, so that you can you can do this ministry with a mm-hmm. with a good and humble spirit without getting uh, without getting angry or hostile. And that's it for this episode of The Mentionables. In this episode, Tyler spoke a great deal about a review he did of McAfee's book. And now that review is its own book, titled Measuring McAfee, available on Amazon, or you can visit our website, thementionables.org, and find the book under resources. Thank you for listening. Keep on listening, and keep on mentioning.